Okay, welcome back. Um, we have a, a bit of a mess to do tonight because we're finishing up a, a, a certain antenna problem. The far field is going, went pretty well. I'll review that in a heartbeat. The near field, a little bit stickier. Um, and I think it's still worth doing because I think it's good for you guys at least to see some of the, you know, what happens with the symmetries and all. So, so it's, you know, we'll, hopefully it'll be enjoyable. Um, but then we have Thanksgiving break next week. And then we have three more lectures, and then the homework test, and then the final. And the three lectures will likely be on um, uh, spherical wavefront scattering and uh, um, diffrac uh, diffraction gradients, which is a type of which you which I'd like you to look at as a type of um, phased array antenna. Okay, so and then diff a diffraction gradient as an antenna as a uh, the basis for a different type of mathematics for antennas. Okay, so uh, so we'll, we'll get there um, after Thanksgiving. I just didn't want you to go home and wondering what we were going to come back to. Okay, all right. So last time we we decided um, after we did the dipole that short dipoles were not very efficient radiators. They had a very very small impedance, and trying to couple you know eight ohms or seven ohms and change into three seventy seven ohms was a horrible mismatch. And so uh, the answer was to make the the, le the length the leg of the make the length of the um, uh, dipole longer, and then we decided that that wasn't that that was the right idea engineering wise, but we had to re just redo the whole problem. And so for symmetry, we decided to use the center feed antenna of height h, which we then considered as a quarter wave. Uh, so the total length is a half wave. Um, we decided also that we could save some metal if we threw a hurricane fence on the, on the grass underneath our tall antenna, and that would reflect the waves, and so it would look like a, um, a virtual image. So this, p th this figure here and this figure here are really the same structure. They're really the same antenna structure, and it takes a little bit of time to think about that, and the, and the, and the, and the fundamental concept is this um, concept of images. Okay. And, and we, we, we know that from observation. If we, if we look in the mirror, we see an image of ourselves. And so if we, if we look, if somebody else is watching us from a small angle relative to that mirror, they're going to see two, two faces. Okay? So that's, that's basically the same situation as we have here. Okay? So you can motivate it by an empirical observation basis if you want. Again, uh, we roughly follow our roadmap. And the roadmap is A is uh, the current to produce the A, the A to produce the H, the H to produce the E, and the E and the H to produce the, the pointing vector and the power flow. So we have um, uh, an integral that we have to do to get uh, A. So we, write, we set up a DAZ in terms of I, uh, in terms of our Green's function. And then we integrate um, above and below the center feed. And it's not, this is not a terribly difficult integral, um, and so we're able to uh, we're able to um, to do it. Now we're in the far field, so we substitute in for r, and we pull out the r, and then we get an integral that's not very hard to do. Okay, just a simple sine times a, times another sinusoid. Uh, for the half wave antenna, these these arguments simplify very nicely, and the integral comes out, and we're able to get a nice closed form expression for a, a sub z. It's in the z direction because the j is in the z direction. The current distribution is in the z direction. So remember, if the current is dancing up and down an antenna that's in the z direction, then a will also follow that as well, vectorially. Uh, the Green's function, e to the i beta r over r, it sits out in front. In fact, this whole term here is the strength of the antenna, the current, the maximum current value, and the R dependence. And so this is exactly of the form that we, we, we did a few a week or two ago, where we, where we derived the generic form for a far field antenna. The, the shape factor, the function that's a function of only theta and phi, is found in here. So it's the cosine of the cosine of theta, the sine squared of theta. And I want to call your attention tonight to this cosine of cosine of theta, Right. Whenever you have a cosine of a cosine of an argument, you get you. It's it's uh, it's a chirped angle. 
right? It's a chirped angle, so it looks like it looks like it's a it's an FM signal, a frequency modulated signal. Uh, but in this case, it's an angle. Okay, and so whenever you have this cosine of a cosine of an argument, you're going to get Bessel functions. And it turns out that this that what we'll do a little in a little bit is we'll try to integrate. Um, we'll have this expression, and we'll try to integrate it, and we'll fall flat on our face. So, 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 so look out for that. Um, now, the a follows the from a follows h, and this is a very simple function. It looks like it's perfectly symmetrical in phi. So there's only there's only the angular dependence. It only points in one direction, and it's only it's only an angular dependence of theta, and so. To get h is actually quite simple. There's only an h sub phi term, and um, the leading term, the one over r term, is is found by that. The electric field is found by from a, from the curl of this, and again we have a fairly simple formula, and so we have um, uh, e cross h in terms of of this s. Parameter. I think that's where we left off last time, right? Yeah. So let's um, let's go back and we'll take a look at the uh, at what we did last time, and we'll we'll try to find the the total power. And that's just going to equal the integral around a uh, around a closed surface of the time average value of s. And when I write this down. I'll get eta I, n, I max squared over the 4 pi. And then I'm left with this integral. And if I work out my dA, I'm left with an integral from 0 to pi over 2, 90 degrees, a quarter of my quadrant. And I'm, I, have to, I have to um, integrate cosine squared of pi over 2 cosine theta over sine theta d theta. And because of this, uh, because of the presence of this cosine here, and frankly speaking, also because of this presence here, those, the fact that I have this and this gives, gives rise to a very, very difficult integral. Um, it's, it's probably, it's, it's a pro, you approach this either two ways, uh, numerically, or you create a special function. Uh, this, this integral is so special it has a name. Uh, ci of x is equal to the integral of x to infinity of the cosine of v over v dv. And the si integral of x is the same thing, but the sine of an argument v over v dv. And if, I, if we do this out, then We in fact do do, but we in fact do better. Remember that that eta is 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 the three seventy seven ohms, so we can gauge what this factor gives us, and um, this average power gives us a a a, a, a point six times the eta times i m squared. So this is i squared r. And we see that our radiation resistance of the antenna, or the equivalent or the equivalent um, uh, um, uh, amount of impedance that this antenna has, is 0.61 that of free space. So we're doing better, but we're still not perfectly matched. So we've raised our we've raised our our, our ohms from, you know, maybe a, a 0.2. 0.02 rather, all the way up to 0.6 by just stretching out the antenna and making it a little bit longer. Okay, so, so, so good engineering, good results, and you now see sort of an idea of how these integrals come together. And I really can't resist uh, talking to you a little bit about the second part of the problem, which is uh, what happens in the near field. Okay, so these integrals, well, we know that for these integrals that they're going to get much harder in the near field. And again, I think it's reasonable for you guys to want to see a little bit of that. Okay? So, again, we have uh, 
our z-axis. And again, we've got some current distribution. And below the axis, we have the same. Height of H. And I'll pick the y-axis. This, this is actually kind of a, a, a clever choice. You'll see by the, because, we, because we define the spherical coordinate system from the x to the y, Picking the y-axis is actually will actually give us a symmetry that that we can extend. Okay, so it's this is not a subtle subtle choice, but it turns out the math will follow much nicer if we do that. Um, and so and so if I pick an observation point p out here, then I have the vector r. that goes to that observation point. Now, it turns out that, okay, so for, for an arbitrary dz, so i dh, for an arbitrary, for an arbitrary dg, dz, dh, uh, located a height h above the axis, I'm going to have the propagating vector, capital R, that takes me to my observation point. Okay? Now this capital R will go from little r all the way up to the tip of that antenna. And so the, it's convenient, or it will turn out to be convenient, to draw R1 to the top of the mast and R2 to the bottom of the mast. Okay? So we have perfect symmetry with respect to phi. If we're in the y plane, then we'll be at phi equals 90 degrees. Okay? So it's almost like a two-dimensional problem. And its spherical coordinates will be, will be fine. Okay? That drastically in improves our, our lot on this. The current distributions, I think this is the same as we had before. I max sine of beta times h minus h and equal to i m sine of beta h plus h. Okay, this is for h greater than zero and this is for h less than zero. Okay, now let's take a look at these expressions here, okay? And if we just look at r, r is equal to the square root of x squared, I'm sorry, y squared plus z squared. This capital R is z minus h squared plus y squared. And therefore, for um, r1 and r2,
Okay. All right, so for our first step, we look to get AZ. And again, we do Euler's rule for the sine. So this breaks apart into four terms. Notice that Euler's rule has a one-half in it, so the four becomes an eight in the denominator. So I've got four terms. Is the imaginary number absorbed somewhere? What imaginary number? When you go from sine to Euler's and over 2j? Oh, um, no, it's just left out of my equation. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, now, instead of doing these integrals right off the bat, what we're going to do is we'll, we'll actually find the h. We'll, we'll save doing the integrals until the very end. Okay? So what we'll do is we know we're looking for a mu h sub psi, and that's going to equal the curl of a, that points in the psi direction now by picking this here we see that the psi, di the psi direction is actually in the x direction right along this one plane okay so It's going to equal minus mu h sub x.
and we're going to take the divergence of we're going to take the derivative with respect to z and that's in the r direction so this is actually going to be minus del az del y so it's a funny little way of of doing a spherical coordinate system but in cartesian coordinates just because we happen to have that symmetry. And that should, that should cause you some time to think a little bit about that. Okay? But if we do that, then we're able to find an h sub psi. And again, we're writing this in terms of four integrals. There's your I. Interchange the order of integration and differentiation. And you'll notice that these integrals are more or less of the same form. So what I'll do is I'll focus on uh, just the first term because they're all pretty much of the same form. And I won't bore you that much or I won't try to bore you that much. So we'll, we'll, just, we'll just sort of handle that first term. Now taking the derivative
And remember that capital I R is an implicit function of Y. So when you take D by DY, it's a chain rule. And so we can actually do this integral. The sinusoidal current distribution helps us do that. And when we substitute in the capital H for little h, we wind up at the top of the mast. And so we're able to write things in terms of the, of the, of the vector R1. Okay? And as we go on, we'll see what that means physically. Okay? As a, that, that has, that, that's, a, that's a nice mathematical expression, but as, as, as we'll see, that's actually going to have, that's actually going to have, give us a physical interpretation of what this antenna is doing. Okay? So I just wanted to point out that it's the, doing the integral and substituting it in is what gives us the expression of R1 into the equation. Okay? All right. A little bit more simplification. Still just the first term. And if I look at what R1 is, R1 squared minus H minus Z quantity squared, if I do all this out and substitute in for R1 squared, then this is just R squared minus Z squared, which is just equal to Y squared. So working back to the definition of what R1 squared is, greatly simplifies this. And so this term then becomes
And this is term number one. The other terms are Term two. And as you expect on terms three and four, you get expressions with R2 in it. Now, there's a lot of symmetry in all these terms. And so even though it's kind of complicated, we have to add all four terms together. And lo and behold, there's a lot of cancellation. So it turns out when we have four of these things and we add them together, we actually get a simpler formula. And so H psi... There's your I. So given where we've been, that's an acceptably nice, pretty expression. I always thought that when, you, when you're working a problem like this, that has so much symmetry and is so nice and governed by such nice physical laws, that if it didn't reduce down to something palatable, it was a clear sign of an algebraic mistake. All right, we can move on to E. And again, we're in the x equals zero plane. And so I'll have two terms.
an EZ term and an EY term. And so EZ And if I clean things up for this Y and these R's and make it, get it back to our coordinate system that we like, I get three terms. And that's from that's from my EZ. The EY term. Gives us something not too sim not too dissimilar. Factor out in front of this term, factor out in front of this term, and a factor out in front of this term. So let's take a look. The easy is the cleanest expression. Let's take a look at these three terms. One, two, three. And then let me draw the antenna again. minus h, positive h, that's the z-axis, y-axis, and I'm looking at some observation point p, and I have a connection that was r1, right? Let me make sure I labeled that right. 
are one is from the top of the mast, our two is from the bottom of the mast, and from the center of the mast, that was just little r from the center of the coordinate system, right? And now if I look at term one, this is an e to the i beta r1 over r1. That's as simple as can be. That's the Green's function for something that sits at the top of the mast. And a Green's function is just a spherical source. Right? That's term number one. Term number two is a Green's function for R2. So that's the same as a spherical wave front that sits at the bottom of the mast. Now I've got this phase term in here. 2 beta h. I've got this phase term in here. Oh, actually I should look at this guy here. I have this 2 beta h here, but this just controls, this, this will go from minus 1 to 1. This can, depending on what beta h is, resonance is. This piece here is the Green's function that sits at 0, the origin. So again, I've got a spherical wave front that sits at the origin and radiates out. And so now we can interpret the, what this antenna is doing as the interference of three, phys, three phased spherical wave fronts located at the edges of the antennas of the metal. Okay, And this is a ramification And well, that's, that's an example of Huygens principle, okay? Where Huygens principle is if I have an aperture, I line it or I smear it with spherical wave fronts, and I adjust the strengths, and I adjust the phases of the spherical wave fronts in accordance with the incoming wave or the outcoming wave. So if I want to, if I want to look at a horn antenna, for example, I can build on these Green's functions, I can build on these spherical wave fronts, and I know where to line my aperture with. Okay? And it's really interesting that Huygen came up with this, the, the, the spherical wave function approach. He came up with Green's functions, basically, and the, and, the, and, the, and the convolution integral of waves function much, 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 much before... Fourier, before advanced mathematics, before Maxwell, before any of any of that, any of those those, that, that, those chapters of electromagnetics. So I'm just I just imagine Huygen Huygen was Dutch, right? And Dutch is known for a few things, among them um, canals and beer. And so I just imagine Huygen sitting there, you know, contemplating the propagation of light. And taking a beer bottle and throwing it into the wa into the canal water, and just watching the ripples spread out, and then maybe taking two beer bottles and throwing it in there, or in this case three beer bottles, one at the top, one at the bottom, and, and all, and then the interference from the waves is what forms the constructive and destructive interference at the observation point. Okay, I think I think it's really in, really this is a pain in the patouche of a derivation in the near field, right? You have to play games with the, with the, with the, with the, um, the coordinate system. You have to get lucky on your integrals. And then at the end, you get a really nice picture, a really nice physical picture of a very sensible antenna structure. Okay? 
and that's where we're going to pick up after Thanksgiving. Um, we're going to we're going to we're going to take a look at horn antennas, or more likely, we're going to take a look at um, a small sliver, or the, the, we'll go back and we'll revisit the single slit, the double slit. From there, we'll extend to many, 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 many pairs of slits, and we'll call that a diffraction grating. But we don't have to call it a diffraction grating. We can call it a certain type of a phased array antenna. And so, and so we'll, build up by, we'll build up from this picture, of, uh, uh, mostly in the optics, as examples, but more to the point, similar antenna structures. Okay? And I've seen, these, I've seen these phased array antennas, and they are lots of tiny little horns with horn antennas, apertures, with very, very sophisticated circuitry behind it. They'll make, take up a, 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 a total aperture this way. And what each of those horns is doing with each of the phase and amplitude driving behind it is to adjust the relative phase and the relative strength of each and every spherical wavefront on each and every aperture. And by doing that, they can steer the beam and shape the beam tremendously. And so the, the work that we'll do will sort of point the direction to that. I do confess it will be in the optics world, but I think that's just because you can, you can easily see it with your eyes. And wavelength will scale no matter what. Okay?